we are talking about the second set of current affairs species adaptations and the habitats there this article is again picked from the hindu very recent one how does antarctica and uh, how does antarctica's only native insect species survive extreme weather here there is you have to remember these facts firstly the name of the organism please write it down not the scientific name but the no, common name antarctic midge okay let's see what how does it survive you know that in antarctica there is 6 months of harsh weather and 6 months of sunlight to survive in that stage in year one let's say there are two phases for this basically just like how you know larger animals go into hibernation the smaller insects kind of stop their life activity that's their way to adapt so that they don't die they have the ability to stop their life activity inside their body so there is a pre programmed dormancy at a fixed time in the life cycle so if weather changes if climatic events change the weather patterns of that region this pre programmed program will no, not work anymore which will threaten their existence that's the point you need to understand most insects in temperate regions use facultative diapause meaning it is triggered by an environment but obligate diapause is rare what does this obligate diapause mean it is pre programmed and that's the reason why this uh, you know that's the reason why this current affairs becomes very important for centuries de- decades centuries millennia thousands of millions of years ago antarctica has always been that region where it is cold from the ice age itself even before the ice age probably and that is the reason in the his evolution you would see that such pre programmed uh, adaptive mechanisms are there that is changing what was not possible in millions of years ago human being started to do that from 1750s that is the important thing okay next up logger turtles they use geomagnetic field to navigate large distances again this is you know um, a news picked up from the hindu what is this magneto reception they can learn remember associate magnetic fields with food see just like how you know there is a uh, term picked up from newspaper last year like beetle dance or something like right? how honey bees try to gather the food give signal to the rest of the bees and how the queen bee leads there was a question on this So here we are talking about something called turtle dance. Loggerhead turtles use geomagnetism to sense the direction of the food and perform something called turtle dance. Okay, this will give you an idea of the feeding and breeding sites after long migrations. And here you need to understand some important facts. These are marine turtles are always mostly water loving. If you take a look at their flaps or tortoises have feet because they are terrestrial. That is they. live on land but when it comes to turtles they have flaps they swim if you watch this movie finding nemo you would notice that there is a giant tortoise which is swimming and helping the protagonist that it's basically marine reptiles here there is a important interesting fact sexual dimorph just like in human beings how we can differentiate male and female even in these loggerhead turtles we can differentiate based on physiology male and female turtles they found in atlantic pacific indian and mediterranean sea basically they travel they are globe trotters so they move from one place to another so they migrate from one place to another to survive that's their way to adapt and because that is the case they are hunted and that's the reason international trade is banned some important points some mistakes that people do loggerhead turtles are they herbivores obviously not they can they have to eat whatever they get since they are swimming in deep oceans They're omnivores, not just plant eaters. They eat both, whatever they get. Magneto reception is this unique to turtles? No, other species also have it. So don't make that mistake that you know this is only for this species. Just because it is cited, I mean, just because it is listed in sites, doesn't mean it is the most critically endangered species. It can vary from place to place. I U C N because this is a globe trotter. It it moves from one place to another. In certain areas, it can be critically. uh endangered or it depends on the regional conditions and the protection that these uh, let's say for example if they come to a place for nesting or mating if people come and disturb that region obviously they will you know just vanish from that place this is exactly what happened in mumbai olive ridge turtles came to mumbai usually we don't associate olive ridge turtles with mumbai you mostly find them in rushikulya uh, and uh, orissa part okay but when these turtles came to juhu beach in mumbai people started to hit them on their shells they got scared and they left so if you give a critically endangered status there people will stop doing this kind of, i mean they will be 
restrain from doing this kind of activities. So don't make the mistake that just because it is uh, Appendix 1, the IUCN status should definitely be uh, critically endangered. Need not be. If it is definitely that way, it's a coincidence. But it is not a rule that every endangered species, sorry, every uh, Appendix 1 species should be critically endangered. Other way can be true. Now, another important zebra fish. They're able to repair damaged hearts. Can human beings, if the heart muscle fails, can we repair our human body? Can it repair it on itself? No. But if you learn from zebra fish, how they're able to do it, probably it can help us in medical devices. Again, this is biomimicry. So this zebra fish has a unique regenerative ability. Unlike human beings, within 60 days, if something happens to that heart, it will completely restore the heart function. There is one protein called HMGA1 protein. Not expecting you to remember the protein name, etc. But remember that proteins are so important that every life activity and enzymatic, enzymatic activity or any catalyst, they're dependent on proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. And not every amino acid is produced by our body. We get them through food. That's why there are non-essential amino acids and essential amino acids. Okay. <clears throat> so this protein is... Something like it's, it's, it removes the roadblocks on chromatin, unlocking dormant genes for regeneration. In easy language, asan basha mein agar bolu, to this protein will ensure that whatever is stopping the body to repair, it will you know remove that roadblock. Do human beings have it? Yes, during embryonic development. But this is turned off in adulthood. Okay? If we want to experiment on human bodies on how this will react, we have to carry out certain experiments. So recently there was an experiment on mice. What happened? So they applied this protein to damage mouths, hearts. What happened? Without any side effects, it was repaired. So if we can apply this in human beings also, maybe we'll have some breakthrough in the future. That's the reason it is important. Marine heat wave killed 4 million Alaska seabirds. It's a very big event. 4 million, 40 lakhs. Extreme climatic events are harmful. We all know that. What are the Seabirds, this is the name, Muri seabirds, Muri or Muri, whatever you can, it's a common noun or proper noun, you can call it whatever you want. <clears throat> what is the most important thing that you need to know? We spoke about a concept called climate tipping point. So seabird decline is an impact of the fact that we are moving towards a climate tipping point. Please remember that. Normal confusions that people have when we are talking about marine heat waves is it like a temporary increase in the sea surface temperature no this is not a regular temperature fluctuation if it is a temporary fluctuation the systems are good enough to take care of themselves but these are prolonged and intense events that happen to continue over a period of time and they kept they keep on getting worse and worse just because one species of bird is affected not every bird is equally impacted don't try to generalize that one more point an ecosystem shift doesn't you know uh, there is no uh, evidence that population will bounce back immediately just like that after this heat wave event is over that's what we would assume right if a temporary flood occurs in a system if you build it back better everything is going to be normal unfortunately in this case that's not okay just a minute like if you want to note it down just note it down this is an important fact okay next up we are talking about sea otters in california see invasive alien species this is a very important topic in california there is an invasive alien species called green crab this green crab is occupying the entire region and you know it is making the life difficult for other species that's what invasive alien species generally do. It was introduced into the waters of that region through ballast because of ships that brought water along with it. In that water, there was there were green crabs and they came and occupied that region's ecology. When you have this kind of uh, natural, naturally induced problems, invasive alien species is not something that is directly man-made. Humans definitely have influence, but it's not like we are breeding them there. We have bought them, but we are not breeding them. So a technological innovation cannot address this problem. We have to address this through nature-based solutions only. And it is in this context, you need to know the concept of ecosystem engineers. There are certain species, look at the beauty of the nature and the design therein. There are certain species which take care of this concept called homeostasis. We already discussed this in the previous class. It's Nature is always about balance. If we want to maintain that equilibrium, we have to respect the individual roles of that stakeholders. In this case, sea otters, why is it important? Because they have a peculiar nature. This peculiar nature is they eat a lot of food 
to keep themselves warm and to survive. Otherwise, they just die. And luckily for them, green crabs are a very good food for them. So you, how can UPSC ask a lot of questions on this? There can be a prelims question on the natural predation as an invasive species control mechanism. Nature-based solutions, like I told you. Then you can have kelp forests because this is the region where kelp forests, uh, in this region, you will have this kelp forest where you will see this sea otters. They're not just mechanisms of carbon sequestration. In the previous class, we have discussed on the theme of carbon. Whatever you take in should be put back into the system and nature has a way to do it. Carbon sinks. So these forests are like carbon sinks and marine sinks are much more powerful than the land-based we already discussed that. So these green crabs are also, you know, disrupting the kelp forests. So it's creating that balance again. So there is a reserve in California, a place called Elkhorn Slow Reserve. Not important to remember the name, but just remember that location, California. You can go through the maps. So sea otters are consuming almost 1 lakh sea uh, green crabs every year. So this is keeping the balance there because they're non-stop, they're the green crabs are consuming a lot of uh, vegetation in that region. Human eradication is not possible. So we introduced sea otters there. They took care of them. One important point that you need to know here is there are many uh, organisms like whale, seals. They have a lot of fat. This fat will keep them warm. Sea otters, in fact, they're in the sea. They also become cold, right? So they want to keep themselves warm. Unlike these whales and seals, which have a lot of fat, they don't have it. They have very high metabolism and body produces a lot of heat. So when you are producing a lot of heat, you need a lot of food. They eat almost 25% of their body weight daily. They're voracious predators. And that's the reason they are very successful in that. That's the beauty of nature. What is happening because of this? Even the kelp forests are, you know, protected. Not just the green crabs, they also hunt urchins. They also, you know, feed on the kelp forest. There is a balance maintained. So with one introduction of a nature-based solution, we are having conservation of kelp forests, which is preserving the carbon sinks role. And then you also have the balance to address this invasive alien species. Okay. Important fact, green crabs are not native to US. It can be a trap. It's an invasive alien species. Kelp forests are not only carbon sinks, but they're also ecosystem providers. Like a lot of organisms survive there need to remember this fact okay this is the most interesting and the most uh you know challenging part for a lot of students in the last few years a lot of questions are appearing on monkeys primates apes etc let me take this news item as an example or a context for expecting the next question so last year we had had we have had questions on bonobos we'll see what a bonobos is what is a langur you must have heard these terms in all the uh, environment textbooks. But unless or until you have a proper structure, you can't remember any of this. Okay. So using this news item as a cue, let me help you explain through a structure how to remember all the species and where they are found in India. It can help you logically guess certain questions. Now, we are talking about something called primates. Basically, when you think of primates, these are like the early ancestors of human beings. Any anthropology students here, I don't want to ask any anthropology. Most of you guys are probably having anthropology. So you guys might be knowing this better. Consider this like a quick revision of this topic. So if you take a look at the species, primates especially, they have certain characteristics. Look at this opposable thumb. This is the thumb. What do you mean by opposable thumb? You are able to, you know, hold something because of this. If you realize the beauty of uh, human anatomy, you are able to hold something, you are able to move something and that has given a lot of power in evolution. Like we take things for granted. The fact that I'm holding this pen right now, the fact that, you know, I'm able to write with it. It's a sign of intelligence and evolution. It all began with primates, opposable thumbs, forward facing eyes. Look at a horse. Do you think, look straight, you know, they have opposite directions like the they're placed in opposite directions primates they're closest to the human beings they, they can look straight they're forward facing eyes and large brains as you move from a lower order primate to a higher order ape and then human being you will notice that our cranial capacities cranium means the the you know the structure which holds our brain our capacity to think gets larger and larger and it's, it is a sign of intelligence and sophistication and then whenever there are uh, more number of intelligent beings you would see social structures coming into existence just like how human beings live in societies those apes or those closer to human beings like chimpanzees 
which hold 99% of the same DNA as ours. They also have certain social skills. They also have ways to settle conflicts. They'll fight. I'm not talking about the Planet of the Apes movie. It's actually true. It's not completely fiction either. They do have emotions. They do have intelligence. There are a lot of studies on this. And because UPSC is asking a lot of questions on this, I'm trying to explain this in detail. Look at this. Anthropology students, this is also a case study for you guys. You have a topic in Anthro where they're talking about religion and there is a concept of totemism. You have totems like cult symbols. In primitive times, baboons in African regions, like they're considered to be their revered, like as if they're gods. As and when human beings started to settle down into agriculture, they're considered nuisance. And as the societies evolved today, the reason why this news is so viral across the world is the fact that little children tried to kill, I mean, not tried, they actually killed a lot of baboons citing that they are bad omen, superstition. Do we need to address this? Definitely. Because we are disturbing the equilibrium of this world. We need to educate ourselves. And it's not happening just in South Africa. It's happening even in our country. India has only one ape called the Hula Gibbon in Assam. We'll get back to that. But we only have one species. We're doing nothing to conserve it. It's a, it's a problem. Okay. Let me come back to that structure that I'm talking about. Primates have this... I'm not expecting you to remember any names and uh, scientific you know, terminology. Okay. So primates are, you know, divided into Strepsirini and as you can see here, Haplorini. I'm not expecting you to remember the names. Again, I'm clarifying. So just consider that there are two branches. The first branch has something called Limors and Lorises. Are they found in India? This is the question you need to ask. Yes, they are found in India. There is something called Mysore Loris. There is something called Slender Loris. This is found in Madagascar. You will see this continuously in news. Please understand this is very important. The lemurs and lorises, they are very important. They are usually found in Africa. And if you have to understand this like a story, these are like the grandparents of civilization. The oldest living on trees. Where, what is the habitat? 